February 17, 2025. For centuries, Mount Etna shaped life in Sicily, but now scientists record surface temperatures well beyond 200 degrees Celsius, hot enough to liquefy roads and deform steel. No lava, no warning, just an expanding heat wave authorities say they can't stop. So what triggered this invisible disaster? And why can no one explain its source? To find out, we go back to the very first sign that Etna's ancient patterns had finally shattered. Long before anyone measured heat with satellites or worried about melting roads, Mount Etna stood as both a threat and a blessing to the people of Sicily. For thousands of years, its slopes have been home to farmers, shepherds, and entire towns who learned to live with its moods. The volcano's black soil, rich with minerals, fed vineyards and orchards that became the backbone of local life. Generations built homes and traditions in its shadow, trusting that Etna's eruptions, while sometimes fierce, followed a pattern that could be read and respected. By 2013, the world recognized Etna's significance. UNESCO named it a World Heritage Site, not only for its geological value, but for the way it shaped human civilization on its flanks. The mountain's continuous eruptions, documented for over 2,700 years, made it a living archive of Earth's power and resilience. Stories of past disasters and miraculous escapes are woven into Sicilian folklore, each one a reminder of the delicate balance between creation and destruction. Today, nearly 700,000 people live on the volcano's slopes. Their cities and villages, Catania, Nicolosi, Zafirana Etnea, are more than dots on a map. They are living communities filled with schools, markets, and centuries-old churches. Roads wind up the mountain, connecting families who have called this place home for generations. For many, Etna is not just a backdrop, but a constant companion, shaping the rhythm of daily life. The volcano's presence is everywhere, in the architecture adapted to withstand tremors, in the festivals celebrating the Feast of St. Agatha, in the fields where olive trees and grapevines cling to black volcanic earth. Even after eruptions, residents return, clear away the ash, and rebuild. This cycle of destruction and renewal has defined Sicily's eastern edge for as long as anyone can remember. Now that legacy is under threat in ways few could have imagined. The same mountain that once gave life and identity to an entire region stands at the center of a crisis that puts centuries of heritage and the safety of hundreds of thousands at risk. What happens here will not only test the resilience of local communities, but may force the world to reconsider what it means to live on the edge of nature's oldest forces. At 8.45 on the morning of February 17, 2025, Satellite sensors over Mount Etna picked up something that should not have been possible. The MODIS instrument registered a thermal flux spike of 1.87 gigawatts, 10,000 times higher than the volcano's baseline for that month. The data stream flagged the event in red, triggering an urgent review at the INGV Monitoring Center in Catania. Within minutes, field teams began cross-checking the satellite readings with ground-based thermometry. A surface temperature of 212 degrees Celsius was confirmed less than one kilometer from the lower cable car station, far from any active lava flow. Lead volcanologist Dr. Marco Ferretto Carlino studied the printouts in silence. He said this is not a lava front, and he tapped a finger on the thermal map. There is no visible eruption here. The heat is radiating through the ground itself. Thermal cameras mounted on the summit crater showed chaotic patterns, bands of intense heat cutting across the landscape and ignoring the usual fissures and vents. The radiative signature did not match any previous eruption. Instead of concentrated hotspots, the sensors picked up wide, diffuse zones where the ground temperature hovered above 180 degrees Celsius for hours at a time. Seismic data added to the confusion. The B value, a key parameter used to track the ratio of small to large earthquakes, collapsed over a 36-hour window. 
For two decades, this metric had helped scientists anticipate eruptions by revealing stress changes in the crust. Now the abrupt drop suggested something massive was shifting beneath the surface. Yet there was no corresponding surge in tremor amplitude or gas emissions, just a silent, relentless pulse of heat. Thermal and geophysical specialists pored over the numbers. One analyst reviewing the satellite flux charts muttered that we are seeing a pattern that does not belong to any known magmatic system. The urgency in the control room grew as the evidence mounted. This was not a fluke, nor an instrument error. The crisis was real, measurable, and accelerating. Every data stream pointed to a new kind of threat, one that demanded immediate on-the-ground investigation. Sirens echoed through the lower villages as evacuation orders swept across the slopes. By noon, more than 50,000 people were told to leave their homes, gathering what they could carry and crowding into convoys heading toward the coast. The main highway SP-92 became a scene of chaos, asphalt, once solid, shimmered and buckled under temperatures recorded at 185 degrees Celsius. Tires burst and shoes stuck to the softening road. Emergency responders struggled to direct traffic away from the worst zones, their radios filled with static and urgent calls for backup. In the village of Padara, a field team lead from Sicily's Civil Protection Agency stood beside a collapsed cooling rig. The equipment, designed for industrial fires, had failed after just 20 minutes. Its hoses melted and the pumps seized, leaving only warped metal and jets of steam. The responder said that they tried everything, foam, water curtains, even pulling in equipment from the airport. He said it was like the ground was fighting back and that they could not stop it. Families scrambled to board buses as the ground beneath their feet radiated heat strong enough to blister skin. One resident, Anna Lombardi, carried her five-year-old son wrapped in a blanket, his face red from the walk. The road was sticky, like tar in summer. They had heard it was safer up the hill, but even there, the walls inside the school were hot to the touch. The evacuation zone grew by the hour. Maps updated in real time showed the melt line creeping toward Nicolosi and Mascalusia, swallowing farmland and outpacing the efforts of local crews. Police blocked access to the worst hit areas, warning that even rescue vehicles risked breakdowns if they lingered too long. The air was thick with the smell of scorched plastic and burning vegetation. Overhead, a haze shimmered where rooftops once stood, now warped and sagging from relentless thermal assault. As the last buses pulled away and the sun dipped behind the mountain, Emergency teams began collecting soil and air samples for laboratory analysis. The hope was that something in the data might explain the heat's behavior if they could get the samples out before the roads turned to liquid. For many, the only certainty was that the mountain was no longer following any rules they had known. At precisely 1437, the laboratory's containment alarms triggered a full lockdown. The sample, collected just hours earlier from the lower melt zone, was sealed inside a double-insulated transport pod. Technicians in thermal suits watched as vapor began venting through the pod's pressure relief valves, curling upward in a dense, colorless plume. The room temperature climbed rapidly, outpacing the cooling system's capacity. Within minutes, surface sensors on the pod recorded readings above 170 degrees Celsius, far beyond anything cataloged in previous Aetna samples. Lab containment officer Elena Russo took command. She ordered the emergency Delta heat protocol, isolating the chamber and initiating remote handling procedures. The sample's vapor cloud tripped secondary alarms as it condensed on steel ductwork, leaving behind a fine, iridescent residue. Preliminary spectroscopy ran in parallel, with the first results flashing across the control panel, a novel silicate metal phase, composition unknown, with spectral lines that did not match any entry in the lab's volcanic mineral database. The core temperature remained unstable, rising in irregular bursts that defied the expected cooling curve. Russo's team logged every data point. The containment log captured the precise moment the vapor breached the secondary seal 
time-stamped and archived for review. Automated sensors flagged a sudden spike in ambient heat, forcing a full evacuation of the adjacent corridor. No one could explain how a fist-sized sample could radiate so much energy without visible combustion or chemical reaction. The material's surface began to deform, slumping inward, as if it were melting from within, but without any external heat source applied. Attempts to stabilize the pod using liquid nitrogen failed. Instead of cooling, the vapor thickened, briefly obscuring the interior cameras before dissipating in a flash of white light. The residue left behind was glassy, brittle, and magnetic, a combination not seen in any previous Etna eruption. Russo dictated her observations into the incident log. She said, Sample behavior is unprecedented. Standard containment ineffective. Recommend immediate escalation to external review. Outside the lab, the incident reverberated through the scientific community. The lab's automated alert system notified regional authorities and the INGV crisis team. The question rippled outward. If a single fragment could overwhelm laboratory containment, what was happening beneath the mountain's surface? The evidence pointed to a phenomenon that existing models could not explain, raising new fears about the true scale of the threat radiating from Etna's depths. Electricity flickered and died across the lower slopes as the Valcorente substation failed under heat that its designers never anticipated. Engineers arriving on site found steel supports warped and insulators fractured, the entire facility twisted by waves of heat radiating from the ground. In less than an hour, a key node in eastern Sicily's power grid was offline. With it went the region's main telecommunications relay, silencing cell towers from Bel Paso to Trekastani. Emergency crews, already stretched thin, scrambled to rewrote power and restore basic communications but the melt zone was advancing faster than any repair team could work. 46 wildfires ignited in a single afternoon, many sparked by overheated transformers or downed lines. Firefighters fought to contain the blazes, but hoses failed as water tanks boiled dry and pump engines seized. Roads that once served as fire breaks now offered no defense. Asphalt softened and ran in black rivulets, swallowing guardrails and signage. In the village of San Pietro Clarenza, the local school's roof collapsed under the combined weight of heat-warped beams and settling ash. The building had stood for over a century, surviving earthquakes and eruptions, but it could not withstand the relentless thermal assault. The economic toll mounted by the hour. Insurance assessors, working from hastily set up command centers, estimated losses at 7.8 million euros each day. The figure threatened to bankrupt local budgets within a week. Markets shuddered as refrigeration failed and perishable goods spoiled in the heat. Water mains, buried just beneath the surface, burst as PVC pipes softened and split. Residents lined up at tanker trucks for drinking water, their faces drawn and anxious beneath the haze. Structural engineer Luca Bianchi, called in by the regional crisis unit, surveyed the damage at Valcorente. He pointed to a section of collapsed switchgear, its copper bus bars drooping like wax. Nothing in our codes accounts for this, he said. We design for earthquakes, for lava, even for wildfires, but not for heat that rises from below, everywhere, all at once. The materials fail from the inside out. As the day wore on, the domino effect spread. Without power, pumps in the city's main reservoir shut down, leaving entire neighborhoods without running water. The region's emergency alert system, dependent on cellular networks, went dark. In the chaos, families found themselves cut off from news and official instructions, relying on word of mouth and battery radios. The crisis was no longer confined to the immediate melt zone. Its shockwaves rippled outward, threatening the fabric of daily life across eastern Sicily. International attention landed on Sicily within days, but the world's response only deepened the sense of chaos. By March 3, 2025, a European Union Civil Protection Task Force arrived in Catania. 
Their convoy of armored vehicles rolled past shuttered shops and empty streets. The team brought high-capacity pumps, thermal drones, and satellite uplinks, equipment designed for floods, wildfires, or earthquakes. Not a landscape where heat itself seemed to rise from the earth in invisible waves. Offers of aid poured in from across Europe, but every proposal ran into the same wall. The crisis on Etna was not behaving like any natural disaster on record. French and German engineers suggested building heat-resistant barriers around threatened neighborhoods, only to learn that previous attempts had failed. Materials warped and split, trapping even more heat beneath their shells. Private contractors from as far as the United States and China lobbied for access to the melt zone, promising experimental cooling compounds and advanced robotics. Their bids were met with skepticism and, in some corners, outright anger. Rumors circulated that some companies were less interested in helping than in securing exclusive rights to study or even extract the unknown minerals now appearing in the devastated soil. The situation on the ground quickly became a flashpoint for political and ethical debate. In the hills outside Zafirana, a regional activist named Sofia Greco organized a protest that blocked a key access road to the European Union Task Force command post. Speaking through a megaphone, she accused international agencies of treating Sicily as a laboratory. She shouted, We are not an experiment. Our homes, our land, our history are not for sale. Her words struck a nerve. In the days that followed, local media replayed footage of the protest alongside scenes of foreign drones buzzing low over abandoned villages. By March 7th, authorities had logged 23 unauthorized drone sorties above the melt zone. Some belonged to private research groups, others to media outlets chasing dramatic footage. Civil protection officials condemned the flights as reckless, warning that drones could interfere with emergency airlifts or spark further unrest among residents already on edge. The controversy spilled into city council meetings and national headlines, fueling arguments over who had the right to intervene and at what cost. Behind closed doors, regional officials debated whether to grant international teams greater authority or to push back and reclaim local control. With each passing day, the lines between aid, exploitation, and protest blurred. The crisis had outgrown any single government's ability to manage. As the heat continued to spread, so did the questions. Who was truly in charge, and whose interests would shape the fate of Mount Etna's people and land? Right now, thousands face displacement as Mount Etna's unexplained heat shatters the limits of science and infrastructure. As global temperatures and geological instability rise, the line between natural force and human vulnerability grows thinner. Our capacity to adapt is being tested in real time. Nature does not wait for answers. It demands them. What do you think? Is humanity ready for the next crisis we cannot control?